one of the ways of writing the same symmetry in two different ways for a pentagon might be, let's say I do R followed by R followed by T. So two rotations followed by a reflection. I end up with a pentagon that looks like this. So maybe the thing to notice is that three is at the top and we're looking at the back side of the pentagon. So what's a different way that I could write this same symmetry? Um, and the challenge that I posed at the end of class is, is there a way for me to do that by doing the reflection first and then doing the rotation second instead of the other way around, which is the way that we have it here. So if this is RRT, then how can I do the same thing starting with a T? So if we decide to start with the reflection, so now we're looking at the backside of the pentagon, now we need to rotate to get this three up to the top. We're going to have to rotate not twice, but three times. So T, R, R. R. And so sort of the takeaway, I suppose, that we could have from that is that TRRR -R -R was the same thing as RRT. Right. So that's one observation that we can make uh, about how, how at least the symmetries of this pentagon work, right? That here's some relationship between doing all the rotations first versus doing all the rotations at the end. Um, and so the question, that, the question that I asked for you was just to sort of find one of those examples. And then some of you were sharing your examples yesterday uh, in the chat site. Um, and the question is, how do we generalize this observation? Right? What in general is the difference between doing the rotations first and doing them second? So the conjecture is, if you rotate k times and then you reflect, that's the same thing as rotating one fewer time and then reflecting and then continuing to rotate n minus 1 times, where n is the number of sides that the polygon has. So, so that was a conjecture. Um, so this equation, and this is the kind of manipulation that we're going to have to start getting comfortable with pretty soon, because this is a large part of what powers abstract algebra. Um, so if we started with this equation, r to the k t equals r to the k minus 1, t, r, to the n minus 1. Notice how we can get from this equation to the simpler one that Colleen just presented to us. Um, if we think of this r to the k over here as being r to the k minus 1 times r, right, so just peel off one of those r's, then what can I do to make this, whoops, what can I do to make this equation simpler? Let's, right, if we believe in cancellation, which is something that right now we kind of have to take as an article of faith, um, until we actually have a formal definition of, of what a group is, and that's going to be Friday's uh, preparatory assignment. Um, but if we believe in the power of cancellation, then we should be able to cancel those k minus 1 powers of r from the left sides of both and get this thing that Colleen just wrote down, rt equals tr to the n minus 1. And again, in view of the fact that um, each of these rotations was a rotation of counterclockwise by 360 over n degrees. That means that, as we said last time, r to the n minus 1 is the same thing as r inverse. Why? Well, because if I multiply on both sides of this equation by r, and I'm using the word multiply kind of loosely here, but if I stick an r at the end of both the left and the right hand expressions, then on the left hand side, I now have how many r's? N minus, n minus 1 plus 1, right? So I have a total of n copies of r. And on the right-hand side, r inverse multiplied by r gives me what? r to the 0. r to the 0, which means don't rotate at all, which is another name for what we call the identity, right? And so this property, again, r to the n should be a 360 over n degree rotation done n times. So at the end of the day, we have a 360 degree rotation, which does nothing. Right? So another way of understanding this equation is that RT is T R inverse. And this is kind of a nice way of understanding it, because now we don't have to bring N into the mix. right? We can just understand that whatever polygon we happen to be working with, RT, so a counterclockwise rotation followed by a reflection, is the same thing as a reflection followed by a clockwise rotation. 
we had the, one of the observations that your groups made, I think it might have been Cam, uh, is that having a T in that expression is like passing through the looking glass. Right? Once you're on the other side of a T, now all of your rotations are going to have the opposite orientation to what they used to. And this equation kind of captures that. You can kind of think of this as the through the looking glass equation. Rotations that happen after the T have the opposite orientation to rotations that happen before the T. But now this is an algebraic equation that tells us how R and T when we're talking about symmetries of polygons, interact with one another. Now that we have this equation here that gives us a relationship, an interaction between R and T, can we use this equation to write every single different word that you could give me using R's and T's in a standard form? So I guess, let, let me give, rather than just R, R, T, uh, no, maybe let's do R, R, T. I guess my question is, how could I rewrite for the pentagon the expression RRT in a way that moves the T all the way to the left side of the R's? And how can I use this equation to do it? So if RT is equal to TR inverse, how can I use that to simplify this expression? The one place we can get a toehold in this expression is right here. This R and this T are adjacent to one another, and we know that wherever we have an R followed by a T, we can replace it with a T followed by the inverse of R. So let's make that replacement. So using this equation in the pink box down there, I'll write this RT as TR inverse. And this other R out front, as you were saying, just sort of comes along for the ride. So now, great, we've taken one step of moving this T toward the front of the line. But now it's kind of stuck in the middle. So what do I do now? Do it again. I again have an RT adjacent to one another. And I can use that equation in the pink box to replace that by T R inverse. OK. And then my extra R inverse is still sitting out there on the right. All right, but this doesn't look exactly like the T R R R that we had a moment ago. So how do I, now that I remember that I'm uh, in the case of the Pentagon, how do I reframe R inverse in terms of T's and R's? So what is R inverse in terms of T's and R's? It's four R's in a row, yeah. I'm just going to write that. So for pentagon, R inverse is R to the fourth. So if I use that, then I can make that replacement down here. So T will be at the head of the line, which is where we wanted it. But now each of these R inverses is going to turn into four copies of R. I'm just going to write them all out in gruesome order here. So now at least. We're back to a world where we only have T's and R's representing our symmetry. But this also looks too complicated compared to where we started. So how can I make this simpler? Five R's in a row is the identity, which is another way to say that the inverse is the fourth power. right? So that's an equivalent form. But yeah, five R's in a row is the identity. Um, let me just write that as an I. I for identity. And so all I need to do then is take five of these R's, write them as the identity. And what is it that makes the identity the identity? What happens when I multiply by I? It gives me something bad. Yeah, it's a transparent operation. So T-R-R-R-I, since I is the identity, that just becomes T-R-R-R. So there is our first example this semester of simplifying an expression. And if algebra is about solving equations and simplifying expressions, that means that we've just done algebra. But we've done it with no numbers other than, well, I guess there were some numbers, right? This four, this five, just some you know, positive integers. Um, and no familiar arithmetic other than maybe the arithmetic of those positive numbers that let us count up to eight, how many r's we had, right? Um, but then this, this is what abstract algebra endeavors to do, right? Is that we're living in this new kind of structure and in this new kind of structure, um, we can still apply that sort of algebraic thinking for using relations that we know to simplify expressions into other forms and understand them differently and hopefully understand them better. Um, and then ultimately also try to solve equations at the end of the day. So now that we've seen a mechanism that allows us to rewrite every element, 
So any element that I give you now in, in this structure, you can always push all of the t's in that expression to the front of the line and all the r's to the end of the line, right? Just by using a process like the one we just did here. So here's the conjecture. Whoops. And the conjecture is, well, I'm going to have you fill in the blank. Um, there are a total of blank many um, distinct symmetries for an n-gon, for a, uh, yeah, let's just say n-gon. So for the case of the pentagon, it would be a five-gon, right? An eight-gon for an octagon and so forth. Um, so what I'll ask you to do is to fill in the blank. And what, and what I'd like to hear about and when you're thinking about this is how does being able to answer this question have to do with being able to rewrite words of T's and R's? So just to get you thinking and to wrap this up, is this number going to be finite or infinite? Are there finitely many symmetries of, a, of an n-gon, or are there infinitely many symmetries? Okay, so there's infinitely many different words that we can spell with t's and r's. Because mm -hmm. after you get to a certain point, so like r t is the same thing as, uh, oh sorry, t r is the same thing as t r five. Yes. We're talking about a, uh, a square. Okay. So it's technically the same thing. So I think that's a finite. So once we simplify all of these words down, are we left with only a finite number? And so we're saying, you know, because we have expressions, equations like this one, we can push all the t's to the front of the line, all the r's to the back of the line, right? So I might have a whole ton of t's at the front and a whole ton of r's at the end, but how do I know that I don't still have infinitely many possibilities, infinitely many different symmetries with as many t's as I want to in the front and as many r's as I want to at the end? Like, why can't I write down a symmetry with 27 t's and 804 r's for the pentagon or something like that? Is that simplified? No. Why not? Oh, there are a of There's a number of identities in there. So what did I just say? Um, 62 t's and 503 r's, right? Uh, for, let's say this is for the hexagon. So what's your best guess as to how that would simplify? What do you, so someone just said something about the t's. T squared is equal to? Which, right, all of them, those are all correct. Remember, T, the, the reflection was its own inverse. If you reflect once and then you reflect again, we're back to where we started. So every pair of T's is going to equal the identity. So if I have 62 T's, I've got T squared repeated how many times? 31, right? And every time I do t squared, it's the identity. So that's really 31 copies of the identity. And what's 31 copies of the identity going to look like? What, what happens if I do same, nothing 31 times? I, it's about t to the 0. Yeah, it's, it's the same thing as t to the 0, so well which is the same thing as the identity. So all those t's end up going away. Now how about r to the 503? So divide that by 6. Divide it by six, why six? And every six rotations of the hexagon is going to give you? Nothing. Nothing. So, right, so divide it by six. So how many sixes, let's see, what's 503 divided by six? Oh, great, uh, why did I choose such a challenging one? So it's 480 plus 33, uh, no, no, 86 point, 86 with a remainder of five? So then what I take that to mean, Oh, wait, no. No, I'm yeah, that doesn't no, sound, no. that doesn't seem 83 right. 83 with a remainder of 5? 83, yeah. Actually, it doesn't, turns out it's not going to matter. Your first answer would have been just fine to our, to our final <laughs> yeah. result. But let's be honest mathematicians about this. Um, so, all right, so you rotate 6 times, 83 times, and then you do 5 more at the end of the day, right? And what happens every time we rotate a hexagon 6 times by 60 degrees? It becomes the identity. And so those 83 repetitions of the identity are also just going to give me an identity. 
and that identity and the identity before it transparent. And so at the end of this process, t to the 62 and then r to the 503 just ends up being r to the fifth. So all that's happened to this hexagon at the end of the day is a rotation by 300 degrees, or if you like, negative 60 degrees. Right? So why does that tell me that the number of symmetries is going to be finite? How many t's am I ever going to have in my word if I push all the t's to the beginning? I'm either going to have none or I'm going to have one, because as soon as I have two, I can simplify it away. How many r's am I going to have for my hexagon at the end of the word? No more than five. I could have zero. I could have one, two, three, four. I could have five. But as soon as I have six, I can get rid of it. Right? So I can have a maximum of, uh, well, I have two choices for how many t's that I have. I have six choices for how many r's that I have. How many words do I have? How many words can I make that fit those criteria? Two choices for t's, six choices for r's. Whether or not those choices are independent of one another is a separate question. So that's why there's a little bit of work to do. But keep in mind that zero is a possible number of t's and number of r's. So we really do have six choices for how many r's, zero through five. Two choices for how many t's, zero and one. Twelve. So what we would need to do is we would need to convince ourselves that those are the only possibilities and that, so we've already, I think, convinced ourselves that these are the only possibilities. I'm going to be kind of loose about notation here. Zero, one, two, three, four, five. Right? Two choices for how many t's, six choices for how many r's. That gives me a total of 12 choices. And the only thing we need to do now is verify that all 12 of those words are actually different from one another. Like maybe it's the case that two of these, maybe t r to the fourth is the same as r to the one or something. We don't know that just based on what's written up here, but you can pull up the, the little scratch applet or whatever and just convince yourself just by drawing them out that all 12 of these are actually different. And we know that there can't be any more than 12 because as soon as we would have something more than 12, we would be able to rewrite it as one of these. So 